All right, enough of the boring interface overview stuff. Let's actually make a thing. And today it's going to be a solar system. Uh, we're going for something like this. Uh, in the next two hours, we may not have time to get through all of the animation, but I want to demonstrate each part along the way. Uh, the nice thing about animating a solar system is it gives you some good repetition to um, practice the same thing over and over again, or in this case, nine times uh, in a row since I am including Pluto. Uh, I said this before, but I'm including Pluto not because I miss its status as a planet, but because, if I go to the side view here and select Pluto, uh, as Pluto orbits the sun, oops, it does so at an angle. Okay, you can see it's at a bit of an angle there. Get that out of the way. Uh, and so that presents a slightly unique challenge that the rest of the planets don't. So that's why that's included. And we'll, we'll talk about that once we get to the animation part. So this is where we're going. Um, here's where we start. File, new, general. Uh, I will, sure, I'll save, doesn't matter. All right, so we have our default Blender scene. And uh, a couple things that I want to do first. Uh, I'm going to hit Command-Shift-S to save as. And I'm going to call this... Uh, solar system, and I would love it, one, if you spelled it correctly, unlike me, uh, but also if you put your last name in the file name somewhere, either at the beginning or the end, uh, so I know whose it is, so that after I download them all and have nine different files that all are called solar system that blend, I know whose is he whose. Um, that'll be a thing going forward throughout the semester, is please identify whose product it is in the file name. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be harping on naming conventions in general. Um, as a rule, anything, any project, anything, 10% um, of the grade is going to be just naming things. If you name things, you get 10% of the points, just flat out. That's how important it is. It can take you from an A to a B or a B to an A. So uh, don't forget to name things. So I'm going to do that. I'm, I have a folder already set up for this. Click Save As, and that's saved. Wonderful. Uh, I also want to go up to Edit and Preferences. Oops. And I'm going to go to the uh, Animation section and Default Interpolation. I'm going to set to Linear. This is probably the only time that we will do this. Um, but the idea being that we want this to kind of loop. Uh, and in order for that to loop, we don't want it to ease in and ease out of the start position. Uh, we want it just to keep the constant speed all the way around. All right, and that's what linear is going to do. Uh, I'll talk more about the graph editor. It'll probably be a while. Um, so if you're familiar with the graph editor, it works the same way in here as it does with After Effects or any other program that uses one. Um, if you're not familiar with the graph editor, don't worry about it. Um, we'll, we'll come back to it. So I'm going to set that to linear. Uh, you may or may not want to set your uh, under save and load. Uh, nope, sorry. Yeah, under system. You might want to set your undo steps higher than 32 by default. Uh, I'll keep mine at 50. That'll be fine. Obviously, the more memory you have, the higher you can go with that. But 50 should be fine. Okay, that's it for the initial uh, setup there. Now we can start uh, working in our scene. So the solar system is, consists of spherical bodies, mostly. Uh, so I don't need this cube, and actually I don't want anything here. So I'm just going to left click and drag across all three of them. You'll see they will all be highlighted. Uh, I'm going to hit X and delete. Get rid of them. Don't want them. Don't need them. So let's add, uh, first, we'll add the sun. So I'm going to, uh, you can either go to the Add menu, Mesh, and UV Sphere. I'm going to Shift A, Mesh, and uh, UV Sphere. Okay. This is what a default sphere looks like. Down in the bottom left, you'll notice this little Add UV Sphere di dialog uh, option. If you expand it, 
you'll see some settings that you have. Uh, so this will control the initial state of this sphere. Any primitive you add will have this window. The important thing to notice about or, or to know about this window is once you do anything else to the sphere, if you move it, rotate it, scale it, um, change the vertices around, extrude anything, you won't have these options anymore. Okay, you get kind of one chance to set these options. After that, you'll have to, if you want to add more rings, you'll need to do it a different way by adding edge loops or something. So just keep that in mind. Um, but we can keep it at the default. I just wanted to call this out because it's something that, that can take a little while to remember. People tend to forget it. And I just want to start ingraining that in you now that these initial options are here. Uh, and we will be using them more as we go through. Sphere added. Uh, I was just talking about the importance of naming, and that's the second thing that we're going to do. So we add an object, and the very next thing we do is name it. How do we name it? Uh, the easiest way is in the outliner. It's, it's uh, highlighted. Just double click on it. And I'm going to call it Sun. You can call it what you want, but I strongly suggest that you use descriptive names. Don't call it Llama. That doesn't help anybody. All right? Call it Sun. Call it Helios. I don't know. Uh, you'll also notice that the sphere doesn't look super round. You can see all the individual faces. Uh, to change that, you can right click on it, open up our context menu, and these first two options, shade smooth and shade flat. It currently is set to shade flat, so just click on shade smooth, and now it looks much nicer. Okay. So there's our sun. Uh, I do want to set an initial scale for the sun. So I'm going to, if you hit N, it's going to bring up uh, some options here. You can also, if I hide that, you just look on the right side here with the sun selected. Uh, this object properties tab, which is a orange square about halfway down, will have the uh, same uh, options there. Okay, you can kind of compare. You get a little bit, uh, some, some different things, um, but the location, rotation, and scale are the same across, so whichever one you're comfortable with, you can use. Um, but I want to set that to, it appears as though I said 30, so we'll set it to 30. Why not? Um, so you can either type in, in all three fields, 30, and then scroll wheel out so that you can actually see the whole thing. Um, alternately, I'm just going to undo that. And this is the way that I prefer to do it because it's the fastest. Hit S to scale it and type in 30 and hit enter. Okay? And does the exact same thing, um, but that's a, for me it's faster. It's also precise. Uh, if you don't need to be precise, you can just hit S and click and drag. You'll also notice that as I click and drag, the, um, you see the little left and right arrows here that kind of look like a TIE fighter. As you drag them off the edge, they will kind of wrap back around to the other edge. See how I just keep dragging to the left and they, they keep cycling back around? Okay. Just another thing to, to be aware of with Blender's functionality. Uh, but yeah, S30, there's the sun. Um, yeah, so now I'm going to just get it out of the way because it's going to be in the way for a little bit. So in the outliner here, we've got this little eye icon. That's the visibility. I'm just going to click on that, hide it. It's still there. It just It's invisible for now. Uh, and we're going to move on to the next planet, which is Mercury. Same sort of thing. So Shift-A, Add Mesh, UV Sphere. And the scale of this one is like 0 0.8. So S, 0.8. Enter. I'm going to name it Mercury. Okay. You can also name it uh, in the object properties up at the top here. Mercury, uh, right there. Like I said, most things have a few different ways that you can do it. Just remember one of them and uh, go with that. So now, once I have that, uh, I need to position it 
You know, it doesn't exist in the same spot as the sun, so I need to move it. Uh, for that, I'm going to I'm going to turn the sun back on, but now I can't see Mercury, so I'm going to hit Z to bring up my shading options. I'm going to go to wireframe four. Okay. You can also just click up here on the top left viewport shading, and this first option is wireframe. Okay. So now I can see both. I have Mercury selected. Now I want to move it along the X axis. All right, I just want to move it out in one direction because we're going to create all these planets in a line, which I know never actually happens, but we're going to do it because we can. Uh, and so there's a few different ways that you can do it. I can click on the move tool and just drag the red handle which is nice. Uh, you can hit G to move it or grab it, right? And X to constrain it, to limit it to the X direction. If you want to be really precise about dragging it, up at the top here we have this little magnet icon. That turns on snapping. Okay. And once I do that, it's going to snap it to grid increments. All right, so as I hit period to focus on it. As I drag it left and right, it's only moving in increments, so you can be really precise about that. And you can snap to the grid, you can snap to vert vertices, edges, faces, all sorts of different things. Um, but I'm just going to snap to the grid, and I'm actually going to go and hit 1 on the number pad to go into front view, okay, front orthographic, and I'm going to snap it, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit, there we go. So it's about, well, it's actually exactly two units away from the edge of the sun. Okay. It doesn't have to be exactly perfect. Uh, I tend to be a little bit on the perfectionist, anal retentive side of things. So I like it being aligned to the grid. It doesn't have to be. Just make sure you're only moving it in the X direction, and you'll be fine. Okay, so that's Mercury. It's in position. Uh, now we can move on to the rest of the planets. So the next planet is going to be Venus. So Shift A, Mesh, UV Sphere. Sphere and rename it. And with my grid snapping enabled, I'm just going to drag it out to about there. And we're also going to scale it uh, 1.8. Okay. And I can do all of this actually in front view, so just, again, one on the number pad. Add UV sphere. This one is going to be Earth. I'm going to scale it, uh, I believe, two. Yes, two. And we'll put it right about there. Add mesh UV sphere. This one is going to be Jupiter. Oh, no, just kidding. Not Jupiter. I knew that. Mars. Come on now. And Mars, the scale is going to be 1. So I don't have to scale it because it's already at a scale of 1. I'll put that there. Actually, I'm going to move... Uh, no, we'll leave it there for now. We'll be fine. Shift middle click to pan my view over. Give myself a little more space. And I can add in another sphere. This one is going to be Jupiter. And this one is 5.6. I'm going to give this one a little bit more space. Okay. Add another one. S. 4.75 to scale it up. This one is Saturn. You see, if, if I wasn't naming these as I go, we would just have Sphere, Sphere 1, Sphere 2, Sphere 3, Sphere 4, Sphere 5, and you wouldn't be able to tell what was what. Was what. So uh, I think it's already becoming pretty obvious how important it is to name things. Uh, keep going. Oops, wrong button. Add another one. This one is Uranus, 
and the scale is two. Add another one. Neptune S 1.9, I believe. Yes. And lastly, poor old Pluto. S. And I'm going to move him way off. Well, not way off, but a little extra for, further away. All right. So now that I have all my planets made, hit Z again. Go back to solid view. All right. And you can see all of our planets. Um, you'll notice that they are all in shaded flat view. I'm going to keep them that way for a little bit. Um, but towards the end, I will smooth them out. But I want to keep them this way um, for reasons that will become evident once we start animating. Okay, so I've almost finished the modeling. Oh, I forgot the moon. Silly me. Go back to wireframe, add in a sphere. Now this I'm going to call Earth underscore moon. Okay, so if I ever decided I wanted to add all the other moons, which I'm not going to, but if I was going to have multiple moons, then you need to make sure you have a descriptive name for each individual moon. Um, so that's how I'm going to differentiate that. Uh, the scale of that is going to be 0.3. And I'm going to turn off snapping for this. Oops, one. And I'm going to move it eh, right about there ish. Okay, I'll go back to solid view. Again, Z, 6, uh, or uh, this icon right up there. All right, so I have all of my planets uh, created. There's one thing missing. Give Saturn its ring. Uh, and this is going to... There's a couple of different ways that we can do this, as usual. But uh, I'm going to show you a new thing, and that's with this 3D cursor. So the 3D cursor is useful for a number of different things. Uh, one of its consistently useful functions is that it marks the location of where you add new objects. So wherever the 3D cursor is, is where that new object is going to be. Okay. So if I click, or you move the 3D cursor by shift right clicking. All right. So if I shift right click over here, and then sh shift A and add in a cube, uh, well, the cube is tiny, so let me scale it up. Okay, that's where the cube is. All right? So that 3D cursor is where new objects get added. Hold delete the cube. I don't need it. So we want the rings to be centered on Saturn because that's how that works, right? So we need to move the 3D cursor to Saturn. Position the 3D cursor precisely. Uh, we do have this 3D cursor tool right here where we can move it that way. Uh, but even better, I'm going to select Saturn. So just left click on Saturn. I'm going to hit period on the number pad to focus on it. And I'll zoom out a little bit. It was a little too close. Uh, I'm going to hit Shift S. Okay, that's going to open up our snap menu. And we've got a bunch of different snapping options. The one that I'm uh, concerned with is cursor, right? 3D cursor to selected. It's down at the bottom. All right, so I'm going to click on that, and then you see the 3D cursor snaps right to the center of our sphere. All right, that's what this this little orange dot denotes the center, or well, not the center because it doesn't have to be at the center of the object, but it's like the origin of the object, uh, and that's what the cursor is going to snap to. So there are ways to move the center or the origin of an object, and we'll get into that later on. We don't need to worry about that uh, for today. Um, but for now, the 3D cursor is going to snap to that point, and that's at the center, and that's where we want it. Once we have it, now we can add the rings. Hit Shift-A, add a mesh and torus, that's what it's called. 
right? Now it's really small by default, and before I do anything else, I go to wireframe. Uh, I'm going to hit one to go to side view or front view, excuse me, and then uh, in this add torus dialog on the left, I want to change a few settings uh, because you can't really do this with scaling uh, after the fact. So the major radius and the minor radius are what I'm concerned with. So I'm going to bring out the major radius. Actually, I'm going to orbit around so you can see this a little bit better. I'm going to bring this major radius out. It's about there. Go to solid view. Somewhere around there. And then the minor radius will go something like that. Okay. So there is our rings. This isn't the way they're going to stay. This is just kind of the initial getting the geometry in place, then we can modify it further. But something like that. Um, when I was doing this earlier, I did have some reference up. All right, just if you just uh, Google Saturn, the very first option or photo, which is a beautiful photo uh, of Saturn, you can get a kind of an idea of the rough relative size of the rings to the planet. Um, again, we're not we don't need to be super precise, but I'll maybe make it a little bit wider. Okay, I'm just concerned with the width here, and then that this gap here. So maybe we'll make the radius just a little bit more. Okay, something like that. Once I have that, the next thing we need to do is flatten the rings. So for that, we need to scale it down, but only in one direction. Okay, so I can hit. Or I can, I can click on the scale tool here on the left and just drag down the vertical until it's... We don't want it to be completely flat. We still want it to have a little bit of thickness. Okay. You can notice here on the side I've got this scale. I can monitor that number. You can also go into front view and kind of scale it down so it's pretty flat but not all the way. That was something like that. It'll be fine. You know, maybe 0 0.05 if you want to be precise. Okay, so now we have the rings. Uh, the last thing that we need to do is every picture that you see of Saturn, uh, the rings, well, I guess not every picture, but most pictures that you see of Saturn. Maybe most, maybe not. doesn't matter, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, the rings aren't completely level, so we're going to just add some interest. I'm going to click on my Rotate. Uh, tool. Alternately, I can just hit R and rotate it. Okay. Uh, you can also double tap R and then you get kind of free form. So I'm going to go kind of a off axis, that sort of thing. Okay. Also, we need to name our ring. So I'm going to say Saturn underscore ring. Okay. So now Saturn has its ring. Earth has its moon, which is, the Earth's moon is really small here, so I'm going to exaggerate it a little bit. I'm just going to scale it S2, so double the size. Oops, oh, I keep hitting F, that's, that's a Maya shortcut. Um... So everything has been made. Uh, the next step is going to be to start giving it some color. Planets, let's give them some color. Uh, we're not going to get too fancy with materials, but we can at least change the color of them. Uh, we'll start with the sun. And I need to go to the materials tab in the properties editor. Okay, it's this, uh, I guess, pink reddish sphere towards the bottom. I'll click on that. And with the sun selected, I'm going to click New. I need to uh, first name the material. Okay. So I'm, I'll just call this Sun. Nope, not Sun. Sun. Again, being descriptive here is going to be extremely beneficial uh, because you're going to get a lot of materials uh, pretty quick. 
Uh, and then really we only need to worry about this base color, at least for now. So I'm going to click on this on the white field here. And it's going to bring up a color picker. And I'm just going to go with a yellowish orange sort of thing. You can change the intensity of it by, um, or not the intensity, but the brightness of it with the slider on the right. Uh, you can also just use the sliders underneath. So HSV is hue, saturation, and value. Uh, if you're familiar with Photoshop, that, oh, those will sound familiar. You have RGB. Whoops. If you want to change it with the RGB value, so red, green, and blue. You know, we want more red, less red. Uh, and then actually the A is, is alpha, but we're going to keep that at 1. Or if you have a specific color in mind, uh, for instance, the company you're working for has brand colors and you need to use their brand colors, and you have the hex value, you can just type in that hex value. But you, any way you decide to choose a color, choose a color. Uh, let's go here, and I'll saturate that a little bit more. And if I scroll up a little bit uh, in this panel, we've got this preview section. If I click on that, you can see a preview of what that material will look like. Okay, so you can you can actually uh, well, I guess you can't. Never mind. You can kind of play around with that, get it where you want it. Uh, but you can't see it in the viewport. And there's a few different ways that you can solve this problem. Uh, one is if you scroll down here in the material properties, we have this viewport display, and you can change the color there uh, to whatever you want. Uh, you can also, here's a really cool thing that Blender can do, is you can copy and paste most fields. So uh, if I wanted to, for instance, uh, in the subsurface radius section, if I hover over this value and hit Command C or Control C on Windows, and then hover over a different field and hit Command V, it'll paste that value. Okay, it's copy paste, and it works in these input fields. It also works with color. So I can hover over this base color, hit Command C to copy, scroll down to my viewport display, hit Command V, and it'll paste that color in there. Uh, super helpful, super useful. So if you, as you are starting to build more complicated objects and everything is just looking gray and you want to give it some variation, that is how you can do that. Um, alternately, if I just, I'm going to set this back to uh, a regular gray. Uh, oops, that is, that was the wrong field. That's the field that I wanted to set that to. There we go. Um, if I just go to the uh, viewport um, material preview shading, so it's this third icon up here, it's the one next to solid, that'll show me a rough estimate of what my material is going to look like. Uh, you can also hit Z and it's the material preview, it's the second option here. Okay, so that's the way that I'm going to use it. So if I'm in solid view, everything is gray. If I go to material preview, you'll start to see colors. All right, so I'm going to do that for the rest of the planets. I'm going to stick kind of close to uh, reality, roughly. Uh, but feel free to take as much artistic liberty here as you so choose. But I'll select Mercury, click New in our material properties, name it, and set the base color. This is going to be like a kind of a dark rusty sort of thing. Uh, Venus, we're going to go gonna collapse the preview section. And this is going to be kind of a pale greenish yellow. And Earth. There we go. And we'll just go blue for Earth. And the moon is going to be a darker gray. Oops, I'm going to call this Earth Moon again. Be descriptive. I'm just going to darken it down. All right, and I'll continue uh, on down the line. Thing about Saturn, uh, looking at kind of some of the reference for Saturn, you see the rings are similar in color to the planet. 
but a little bit darker. Now, the way that this image looks, it kind of looks like it's it could potentially be two objects. We're not going to get that complicated with it. I'm just going to make them one color. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the color of the planet and I'm going to modify it for the rings. So let me show you how I'm going to do that. First, I need to set the color of my base planet. So new material, name it, give it a color, which is kind of a faded yellow, maybe a little bit darker. We'll go with that for now. Okay. Um, now, what I can do is I can select my ring. And instead of clicking new for material, I click on this little material icon to the left, and I can choose Saturn material. Now, if I try to change the color from here, it's going to change both of them, and I don't want that. So what I can do is I can click on this number two. Okay, this indicates the number of objects that are using this material. If I click on two, it's going to make a copy of that material. So it says Saturn 01, so I'm going to call this Saturn underscore ring. And now I can change the base color without affecting the planet itself. So I'm just going to go with something a little bit darker, maybe something like that. Okay. This is all the planets uh, named. Looks lovely. And in a moment, we will move on to the next step. So, so now we need to animate our scene and we'll start with Mercury. I'm just going to focus on that. And so planets move in a couple of different ways. There's the, um, the spinning of the planet, right, which creates the day cycle, day and night cycle. And then you have the orbit of the planet, which is the year cycle. Uh, let's start with the just the spinning, the day cycle. Uh, and so now we need to start adding keyframes to animate, all right? You animate with keyframes in Blender the same way you do in any other or most other animation programs. Um, I'm going to keep the timeline down here at the bottom. I'm going to keep it at the default 1 to 250. That's a perfectly fine frame range. Um, it's playing back at 24 frames a second, so this is roughly, uh, what is that, 11? Ten and a half seconds. Okay, uh, and so to animate, we need two keyframes. We need a start value and we need an end value. And our goal is going to make this is going to be to make this seamlessly loop. So we're going to generally stick in uh, multiples of three hundred and sixty, just to make it simple. Uh, so first step is we need to set a keyframe for the values that we're going to animate. Uh, in our case, it's just going to be rotation. Um, but when we turn on auto keyframing, it's going to set keyframes for location and scale anyway. Uh, so I'm going to hit, uh, with, with the planet selected, I'm going to hit I. I is for insert keyframe. And when I hit I, I have a whole lot of options. Uh, what I want to uh, insert a keyframe for is location, rotation, scale. It's this third one. I could just do rotation. That would be perfectly fine. But I'll do location, rotation, scale. Okay. When I do that, you'll notice this transform menu that I have open. Uh, if you don't have it open, hit N and it will open up. Uh, it's the item tab. You'll see that these values all turn yellow. That tells me that there is a keyframe for these values at the current frame. If I go to a different frame, uh, which you can do just like by left and right or clicking and dragging on the timeline, you'll see they turn green. Green means that there is a keyframe for that value, but not at that frame. You'll also notice down in the timeline, we've got this little gold, orange diamond. Okay, uh, And that is a keyframe or a key. Okay. Uh, we've got controls. We can jump forward and back between keyframes. I don't have any keyframes right now to jump. Um, you can also, like I said, left and right to uh, move frame by frame. But that's kind of the basics. 
so I've got my initial value set. Now I need to set my end value. So I'm going to go to my last frame, which is 250. I can just click on the 250 on the timeline. Uh, I can use these, the far left and the far right buttons to go between the, the beginning and the end. You can also use shift left and shift right. Oops, you know, the mouse needs to be in Blender. Uh, shift left and shift right to go back and forth between those two. Okay. So uh, I'm at my last frame, and now I need to set that value. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to, let's see, how many times do we want it to spin? We'll say, how about 1440? So uh, it's the, or if I hit R, or I'm going to bring up the tool so we can visualize this a little bit better. Uh, I'm going to have this spin about the poles the same way Earth does. So I want it to spin in this direction. Okay, and that's going to be around this. So, uh, whoops, I missed the line. Okay, so you can just click and drag on the blue, but when you do that, you can't really be super precise with it. Like I said, I want to do 1440, so I can click and drag. Uh, I can also just click in this rotation field and type it in manually. Okay, now, uh, I have changed the value and the color changed but it didn't actually set a keyframe. You'll notice there's no keyframe on the timeline. And if I go back to the first frame, and, I, and then I go back to 250, there's no key, because I didn't actually, I changed the value, I didn't set a key. So once you do that, 1440, you need to hit I again and set the keyframe, or if you just hover over that value and hit I, it'll set a keyframe for it. Okay, it's kind of a, a shortcut. We'll add keyframes manually, um, but for the rest of this, we can do this automatically, mostly. Uh, and that is down here on the timeline next to the playback controls, we have this little record button, and this is auto keying. Click on that, it's going to turn blue, and that means it's now going to automatically record keyframes. Okay. Frames on, auto keyframes on. Let's uh, animate the. Actually, before we animate the next planet, let's see if what we did made a difference. So I'm just going to hit play. Okay, and this is why I didn't smooth out the planets yet, so that you could tell something was happening. Now it's spinning so fast that it just looks like it's shaking back and forth. But if we slowly scrub through, you can kind of see that it is in fact spinning in place, which is what we want. That's great. Okay, I'm going to pause that. Uh, by the way, spacebar, whoops, spacebar is your playback controls. All right, super intuitive. It used to not be spacebar. I'm glad it is now. But. All right, so now let's, with auto keyframing enabled, uh, I'm also going to turn off that widget. Uh, with auto keyframing enabled, let's animate Venus. So I've got the planet selected. I'm going to go to the first frame. Okay, remember, it's, it's this first uh, button here. You can jump to the first frame or shift left arrow. We'll get you there. And there's not a keyframe. I know we turned on auto keyframing, but you always have to tell it the first key. All right, so once you start adding keyframes, then it'll pay attention to it. If you don't tell it to, to be an animated thing, if you don't tell it it needs keyframes, it will never add keyframes. So I hit I, location, rotation, scale. Everything turned yellow. Now I can go to the last frame, and this one we will set to a Z rotation of, let's say, 1080. Okay, see that that turns the appropriate shade of yellow. You see the keyframe popped up in the timeline, and we can scrub through. Uh, I'm actually going to go to wireframe so you can see this a little bit better. You can see that it is rotating just as we want. Okay, go back to solid. Oh, sorry, material preview. That's what we want. For the sake of time, I'm only going to do this for two more planets. I'm going to do it for Earth, and then I'm going to do it for Saturn, because Saturn, the rings will spin, and it'll look cooler than just a sphere spinning, spinning in place. Uh, so let's go to Earth. I'm going to select Earth in the outliner, and I'm going to hit period on the number pad to focus on it. We're going to go to the first frame, 
and hit I, location, rotation, scale. Then I'm going to go to the last frame, and we will rotate this one. Uh, we'll say 720. We'll be fine. Okay. And then let's jump all the way over to Saturn. Go to the first frame. I, location, rotation, scale. And then jump to the last frame, shift right arrow. And we'll say 360. Why not? Actually, no. Let's go. Yeah, we'll do 720 as well. Why not? Okay. So now that's going to spin in place as well. However, Saturn is spinning, but its rings are staying in place, um, which is not, well, I'm going to say that's not what we want. Honestly, I don't know how that actually works in real life, how the ring's motion relates to the planet's motion, but it looks cooler if the rings also spin. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways, as usual, that you can do this. Uh, we could just do the exact same animation on the rings. Uh, but then, if we wanted to change the animation values, we'd have to do it twice. We'd have to do it for the core of the planet and the rings themselves. Instead, what we can do is we can tell the rings just to copy or to follow whatever the planet does. And we do that through a parent-child relationship, uh, which is very simple to do. You select the rings, hold down Shift, and select the planet. All right, we need to select the planet last. Uh, and then you just hit Control-P. It's going to bring up the parenting menu. And we want to choose the second option, Object Keep Transform. Okay. Once we do that, now we scrub through the timeline, and you will see the rings will rotate with the planet. Excuse me. All right, you can also hit space, and you can see the ring slowly rotating with the planet. Adds a, an additional layer of complexity. And I'm going to go back to Mercury. It'll be our guinea pig here. We have Mercury uh, rotating in place. But we also need it to orbit the sun. Now, we can't just animate the rotation because that's just going to spin it in place. We need to give it a second point to rotate around. An empty. Uh, an empty is like a null in After Effects. Uh, it is really just a point in space that has transform information attached to it. You can move it, rotate it, and scale it, but when you um, render it, it's not going to show up. It doesn't have any geometry associated with it. It's just a, a point that you can attach to various objects. Um, so that's what we're going to do now. Uh, the first thing, we want, we want the center of the orbits to be at the center of the solar system the center of the sun, which, as it turns out, is also the center of our scene, the origin of our scene. So I'm going to go to wireframe mode here. And I need to get the 3D cursor back to the center. And the way to do that, or the fastest way to do that, is if you hit Shift S, and we want to snap the cursor to the world origin. Okay, Cursor to world origin, that's Shift S. I put that there, the 3D cursor snaps back to the center. And now I can add my empty right at the center of the scene. Okay, I'm going to add an empty the same way I would add a, a mesh or you know a, a primitive. So Shift A, and instead of choosing a mesh, I'm going to scroll down and I've got empty. And an empty can take many forms. It can be just a plain axis, arrows, single arrow, um, whichever you like. We're just going to choose plain axis or axes. And I'm going to hit period, and we're just going to focus on it for a second. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Uh, it's just three lines, and the, I understand the other two lines are hard to see. Um, hold on a second. All right, again, that's not the right key command for that. All right, so if I move this off the origin just real quick, you can see that it is, in fact, three lines intersecting, uh, mirroring the you know, origin, the world origin. Um, in this add empty dialog or alternately in the preferences here with the empty properties you have two values you can adjust you can change the display types so you can cycle through them and see you can display it as arrows 
a single arrow, circle, cube, uh, sphere, cone, or an image. Uh, it doesn't matter what it displays as. It doesn't change the functionality of the empty whatsoever. It's just if you're using it for a particular process and you want it just to be one arrow versus three, you can do that. Um, whatever kind of makes sense for the application. Sometimes if I'm using an empty for rotation purposes, I'll use either a sphere or a circle. Um, sometimes I'll just use uh, the plane axes. I will, however, scale it up. So I'm going to set the size to 10, just so it's a little easier for me to see it. Okay, so we have our empty. I need to name this now. And I'm going to name this Mercury underscore orbit. Okay. Again, a descriptive name, so I know what it does. When I need to select it, I can. It's called Mercury orbit. Mercury first, hold down shift. And it's actually going to be easier to select this in the outliner here. Shift select Mercury Orbit. Oh, actually, no. OK. So here's a slight tangent. Um, the way the parent-child relationship works is whatever is the active object is what's going to be the parent. So if we select it in the 3D viewport, the second thing I select is going to be slightly brighter orange. That's the active object. So when I hit Control P, that'll be the parent. If I select it in the outliner, it's the first thing that I select is the active object. So in Blender, just pay attention to whichever one is highlighted brighter is the active object. Um, it's a weird thing. So the reason why I was going to select it in the outliner is because you have to be a little bit more precise so you don't accidentally select the sun. But what we can also do, because we don't need the sun right now, uh, is we can just hide the sun. So in the outliner, we've got this little eye icon, very similar to After Effects or, or Photoshop or what have you. I'm just going to hide it. OK, I don't need to see it right now. I know it's still there. It's just in the way. So now I can select Mercury first, shift select the, uh, the empty. If you accidentally get it backwards or you select like three different objects and you want the middle one to be the active object, if you just keep holding down shift, you can just keep clicking around and whatever you select most recently will be the active object. Okay, So you're not, you don't have to do it in a particular order, but again, you want to make sure that your empty is the active one. So once you have that, then we can hit control P. You want to keep the transform. Here's what happens if you don't keep the transform. Oh, nothing. Cool. Sometimes it will, uh, well, I guess because I haven't transformed the, uh, the axis, but uh, sometimes the, the child object will jump around on you or will scale or rotate in weird ways that you don't want. Um, so that's why it's just good to, unless you have a specific reason not to, uh, do keep transform. OK. Uh, you'll notice in the outliner, Mercury disappears. Okay, it's just gone underneath the Mercury orbit icon. So if I click on this little arrow to expand it, you can see Mercury is still there. Now, as I rotate the empty, the planet goes with it. But the planet itself is still spinning on its own. Okay, so now it's rotating in two different ways at the same time. So now the actual animation the same process. So we got a frame one. We're going to hit I to add some keyframes. And we'll go to the last frame. And I'm going to set the Z rotation because it's going to go in the same orientation. I'm going to set the Z rotation in this case to 3240. Okay. And I've got auto keyframing on so that keyframe is set. And now I can scrub through and you can see Mercury spinning around. I can go back to solid view, or actually we'll go to uh, material preview. We'll turn the sun back on, kind of zoom out a little bit, and hit spacebar. And now we have some celestial animation. Move on to uh, Venus. So we're going to hit the 
spacebar to stop the animation. And I'm going to hide the sun. Now, I'm going to, by the end of this, I'm going to have nine empties that all look the same at the same location. Uh, so once I'm done animating one, I'm just going to hide it. So in the outliner, I'm just going to turn it off. See, the planet is still there. I'm just hiding the empty. Uh, but now we can do Shift A, empty, plane axis. I'm going to set the size to 10, and we're going to name it Venus Orbit. Okay. Select the planet, Shift select the empty, Control P, set parent to object, keep the transform. And now I can select just the empty, set my initial keyframes on frame one, go to the last frame, and I'm going to rotate. I'll do this a slightly different way. I'm hit R to rotate, Z to keep it in the in around the Z axis, and I'm going to type in my value directly, which is going to be 2880, and hit return. You can see the keyframe is set. I can scrub through slowly, and you can see it rotating around. Okay. Once I have that done, I'm going to hide that empty and add one for Earth. Again, this is going to be Earth orbit. We're going to set the scale to 10. Parent the Earth to the empty. On frame one, set an initial keyframe. And then on the last key uh, frame, we're going to set the value to 2520. Just taking 360 off each time. Whoop, 2520. There we go. And now we have the Earth rotating as well. Again, all different speeds. That's fine. So we've got the Earth rotating or orbiting, which is you know how it how it does, how it do. Uh, but the Moon is staying in place, and that's not what we want. So we need to kind of do a similar thing that we did with the Earth around the Sun, but with the Moon around the Earth. Is instead of giving uh, the Earth an empty to rotate around the Sun, we need to give the Moon an empty to rotate around the Earth. So I'm going to select the Earth. I'm going to do this in wireframe so we can see this a little bit better. And I need the empty to be added at the center of the Earth. Uh, I'm going to show you two ways to do this. The first way is what we did before with Saturn's rings. So if we hit Shift S with the Earth selected and say cursor to selected, that's going to move the 3D cursor to the center of the Earth, which is exactly what we want. It works fine. Um, another way that you can do that is you can just add the empty first. Then you can select the Earth. Um, let's see. We select the empty, then select the Earth. Shift S. Selection to active. No, nope, maybe not. Hold on. Thought that would work. There we go. Um, selection to active, and then that'll snap the empty to the Earth. Uh, so. Just as a quick aside to, if you want to undo a parent uh, relationship, you can select the child object. In this case, it's going to be the Earth. And then we want to go to the Object Properties tab of, of the Properties window. So it's the orange square. And underneath the Transform section, we have this Relations section. And here you'll see what its parent is. Just click the X, and that will get rid of the parent-child relationship right there. So I have my empty at the center of the Earth. Again, that's select the Earth, Shift S, cursor to selected. And then you can add your empty as you normally would. Uh, I'm going to select this empty. We need to name it. And we're going to call this Earth underscore Moon underscore Orbit. Uh, and also, again, I'm going to scale this up 
just to make it easier to see and select. Once I have that, then I can select the moon, shift select the empty, control P to parent it. Okay, so now I can animate the moon's orbit. So on frame one, we'll just select the empty, add our keyframes, go to the last frame, and I'm going to rotate this 1440. Okay, so now I can scrub through. You can see that the moon is orbiting around the empty, which is great. There's just one problem, is it's not moving with the Earth. Our uh, moon orbit empty. Hold down shift, select the Earth. Control P, keep transform. And now, I will zoom out here. We'll go into... Uh, this view, turn back on the sun. I'm going to also, I want to hide this empty. Um, so you can just select something and hit H to hide it. It's probably it's a bit of a shortcut. I'm also going to move the 3D cursor back to the origin. So that's uh, Shift C is a shortcut to center everything. You can also just hit Shift S, uh, cursor to world origin. It all works. Uh, but now, Let's we'll go to top view and hit play. Kind of hard to see. It moves rather quickly. Let's orbit around. You see that the Earth is moving. The moon is moving with it. I'll actually just scrub through this nice and slow. There you can go. You can see as it comes around, the moon staying with the Earth, keeping up. Everything looks great. Uh, fast forward here to Pluto, because that rotates on an off axis. So we're going to first do the the, um, the normal thing, right, uh, to, to orbit it. So with the cursor at the center, let me hide the sun, and I'm also going to hide my Earth orbit. What other empties do I have in here? Oh, okay, that's it. All right, so I'm going to add an empty, and this is going to be Pluto orbit, and select Pluto, select my, whoops, let me also scale up my empty so I can see it. Pluto, empty, control P, frame one, set my keyframe, last frame, uh, this is just going to rotate to 360 degrees. Okay. So now, oops, Pluto is making its long journey all the way around the sun. It takes forever. It's fine. But, like I said, Pluto orbits at an angle. And your first thought is probably, actually I'm going to keep the sun hidden for now. I'm going to go into side view, or front view here. So the first thought would be to um, rotate it like this, right? Uh, and then you can just rotate it Z. But when you rotate it, it just keeps that inclination the whole way around. It doesn't like it doesn't rotate around this tilted axis. It just rotates. Whoops. It just rotates up high. Okay. And so what we need to do is add an additional, one more empty, All right? So it's going to stay at the origin here. I'm going to add, and this time I'm not going to add the plane axis. I'm going to add a sphere just to differentiate it. Differentiate it. There we go. And I'll, I'll scale it up again. I'll set the scale to 10 so I can see it. Uh, and this is going to be called... Pluto uh, tilt, okay, and I want to parent my uh, Pluto orbit. No. I do. I do want to parent my Pluto orbit to the tilt, okay, I'm going to parent it just like normal, and then it's this tilt is what I will uh, rotate. 
and just, I don't know, five-ish degrees. Doesn't have to be much. Okay, so you can see this relationship line showing that angle. And now, you can see as it comes around the backside, it tilts below what would be, I guess, zero, the horizon, uh, and then back up top. It's probably kind of tough to see on the projector or encoded on YouTube, but it is there, I promise. A little bit. Uh, if you hit uh, control space, it'll maximize whatever window you're in, so you can kind of see a little bit clearer. Uh, but now you can see as I play, there we go, there goes Pluto, and now it's down. And as it swings back around here in a second, there we go, it goes back up. Uh, I'm also going to. No, let's play it on. Go back to the outliner. Um, you can kind of expand out the hierarchy. So you can see Pluto is parented to the orbit empty, and the orbit empty is parented to the tilt empty, and that's the one that actually gives its its inclination. That's pretty much it. We can turn our sun back on. Uh, we can kind of orbit around to an interesting view and hit play. And you can see that my solar system is a little incomplete. But there we have it. Working this, I'm just going to cover a couple of kind of bonus things that I don't, you don't need to do. But if you're looking to make this a little bit more uh, polished, first I'm going to go. Uh, to rendered view here, and uh, I'm going to make sure we are using the EV render engine, which is great. If we click on this uh, pinkish globe here, this is our world settings, and I'm going to set the background color to black. Uh, okay, because space is black, uh, or I guess it's just, well, it's just a lack of light. Um, I'm going to jump back to solid view here real quick, and I'm going to add a light. You add a light the same way uh, you would add any other object. It's just in the Add menu, Add Light. And I'm going to add a sun lamp. Again, this is bonus stuff. You don't have to worry about retaining this. I'm just demonstrating this for video posterity purposes. Um, when you add the sun, the interesting – whoops. Again, that's not the right key command. The interesting thing about the sun is that – its location does not matter. It basically just shoots light from whichever direction you point it. So you can see there's this little like tail on the sun. And that is, whichever way that's pointing is the direction that the sun is pointing. So I can just rotate this around. Um, actually, before I do that, I'm going to go back into my rendered view. And I'll go to front view. And now we can see the sun. And if I hit R, I can rotate it. If I hit R twice, I can rotate it in different angles. So we'll do maybe something like that. Obviously, this is not the realistic thing. You wouldn't, the sun does not get directionally illuminated. The sun is the source. Um, but it's just kind of a way, I'm, I'm more or less replicating this source image, right? So everything, it just has an even light so you can see what's going on. Um, we can add that. Alternately, uh, if you wanted to be a little bit more realistic, we can turn off the light, and then we're going to select the sun and go to materials. And instead of a surface uh, principled BSDF, we're going to change that to an emission. And we're going to bump up the strength. And we also need to go to our render engine and change that to cycles. And now we can see that illumination. Uh, the last thing, well, I keep saying the last thing. It's not going to be the last thing. But another thing is I can select a planet and shade it, right-click on it, and shade smooth to smooth that out a little bit. Uh, you can also just select everything, right-click and shade smooth, so you do it all at once. The easier way to do it. Um, and then... We hit um, well. Let's scroll through the timeline, find kind of an interesting moment, maybe. 
Maybe like right before the end. Ooh, maybe something like this. Maybe there will be an interesting camera angle we can see. Who knows? All right, you can see a bunch of different planets at once. Kind of play around with your angles. Maybe there's an eclipse or something. Um, yeah. Ways to embellish your scene a little bit. Uh, the one problem with this, and I mean, this is the way it is in space. Like, the backside is almost completely dark because there's not a whole lot of light coming from the opposite side. One thing you can do to kind of fake some atmospheric diffraction uh, is if you just go to the materials and uh, go down to this emission value and just, well, actually, we're going to copy the base color, Command-C, uh, paste it to emission, and just make it a little bit a little bit darker. Uh, well, that doesn't really work with the sun. Never mind. That's not a good thing to do. I'll so say what I did in, the, in my other scene, I'll just open that up because it'll be easier. Sure, we'll save it. Um, in this scene, what I did is I have just an exterior light. Okay, so that's giving me the primary illumination on all the planets. And then you can see that some planets you can see the shadowed side and some you can't. The way I fix that is I copied my base color to the emission value and then just darkened the emission value a little bit so you still get some shading, but you don't lose all the detail. Uh, and that's with the EV render engine and an external light. It doesn't work with the mission, but um, some additional things you can do for kind of that stylized look. Again, beyond the scope of what today is about, which is just getting to know your friendly blender. Um, but I'd figure I'd show that anyway. Um, yeah. And then the last, the actual last thing, is if you do want to render this out, um, here's what you need to do. Pretty quick, but uh, this is a video on YouTube, which means you have a pause button. Um, and you know how that works because this is 2020. Um, all right. So once you have everything the way you like it, the next thing you need to do is set your camera up. So I'm going to hit zero to go to my camera view. And if you hit N and go to your view um, options here, you can say lock camera to view. And that, may, that means whenever you do that, whatever your viewport um, options are, navigation thing, uh, Middle mouse button to orbit, the camera will follow is what I'm trying to say. Just words are escaping me. Uh, you'll notice if you zoom out too far, things will disappear. And that's because your camera, let me select the camera. Uh, your camera clipping uh, distance is set too low. So I'm going to add a couple zeros to that to 10,000. And now as I zoom out, nothing will disappear on me. Um, again, middle click and shift middle click will allow you to orient the camera in whichever way you see fit. Uh, something like that. You can kind of scrub through, test it. Maybe we won't have the whole thing the whole time, but you know, figure out what, what you like, what angle uh, works for you. Whoops. Be careful of automatic keyframing with the camera. I'll delete those keyframes. All right, so let's pretend that we like that. Try not to be too picky with this. Uh, now we need to set our render settings. So we're going to go to uh, this tab here, which is our output properties. Set our resolution. So 1920-1080 is full HD. We're going to uh, start on frame 1. We're going to end on frame 249, not 250. By cutting off that last frame, since the last frame is the same as the first frame, um, if we just loop those, it'll, it'll have like an extra hold, and we don't need that. Um, so we can cut off that last frame. Then we have this output setting. So this is where you decide where it's going to render to. So I'm going to go to my folder, solar system, and I'll create a new folder, and I will call this renders. Uh, the way that rendering works in 3D, and again, well, this is a topic for another day, um, 
is it's going to render out each individual frame as its own image, and then you compile that image either in Blender or After Effects or Premiere, whichever you're more comfortable with. Uh, we're going to do PNG, 8-bit uh, color depth. Uh, we'll say no compression because it'll be a little slightly faster. And then once you have that, you go to the view menu here in the, in the 3D viewport just to render out a preview. This isn't going to be full quality, um, but it'll be good enough. Actually, before we do that, I'm going to click on this button right here, which is going to hide the overlays and just show the planets, which is what I want. Then I can go to the view menu, uh, view viewport render animation. And it's going to quickly kind of scrub through in the preview quality render out the animation. You'll see the frame counter going up. Uh, once it gets to 249, it'll be done. Momentarily. Almost there. I could pause the recording, but we've come too far. And there. Okay. So once that happens, I can navigate to where I saved that. Uh, I can also, in Blender, just hit escape to get out of that window. Um, so I go here, 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 and cool, it didn't actually save in the folder that I made. Awesome. So I'm going to select all of those, put them in the folder they belong in. There we go. Okay, so now I have a two, uh, 249 uh, images that I can compile into an animation. Um, I'm going to do this in Premiere because it's the fastest way for me to do it. So I can save and quit out of Blender and we will open up Premiere. It's open. You can click on a new project. We can call it whatever because it doesn't matter. I'm not going to save it. Uh, I'll just keep it at Untitled, which I know is a cardinal sin, considering I was just harping on you to name everything. Uh, in the project window in Premiere, we're going to double click, which is going to in the computer's own time, open up the import window, eventually. There it goes. I will navigate to, whoops, navigate to where I saved my renders. I'm just going to select the first image, go to my options, make sure image sequence is selected, click import. It will import that as an image sequence. Uh, the frame rate will, will be wrong because by default Premiere wants to do 30 frames a second. Don't let it do that to you. Go to Modify, Interpret Footage, Assume 24 frames a second. Once you have that, right click, New Sequence from Clip. It will pop into your timeline. You can hit play. There's your lovely animation. Oops, uh, there's the key command I was looking for. You can see it play back, and then from there you can export it out of Premiere, um, which is just Command M. And we're going to set it to H.264. Default high bitrate is fine. Set your output location. Save. I'll rename it later. Click Export. It'll be really fast because it's just a series of still images. There's nothing fancy about it. And that's it. I don't need to save it. Here's my render. Solar system demo. Uh, it is a 7 megabyte movie. I can tap space to preview it, or I could open it up in QuickTime and set it to loop. I'll go full screen and it'll just play like this forever and ever and ever.